are those songs my mother and yours always sang, fitting rhythms to the whole vast span of life. What was it again they sang? Bathing us, rocking us to sleep, stirring, <coughs> stirring the pot, <coughs> swallowed in part by <coughs> choking smoke. What was it they sang? Harvesting maize, threshing millet, storing the grain. What was it? Do you remember? What was it the woods echoed as in single file, my mother and yours and all the women of the ridge trudged daily, carrying miles, piles of firewood, miles from home. What song was it? And the row of bending women, to what beat did they break the ground as they weeded their shamba? What do you remember? What did they sing at the ceremonies? Childbirth, child naming, second birth, initiation. How did they trill the Ngemi? What was the warrior song? Sing me the wedding song. The funeral song? What do you remember? Sing. I have forgotten my mother's song. My children will never know. <laughs> Michelle Gidai Mugo, where are those songs? Which I suspect is older than many of us in this room. <laughs> We have forgotten our mother's songs. Our children will never know. Now, I am passionate about stories. And I was actually going to speak about stories. But I'm going to do something that the TEDx people might be a little bit iffy about. But I've, I've just been sitting and listening to so much that is going on. And I'm passionate about engaging that conversation. Would you let me do that? Okay. And I wanted to start with Michelle Mugo because I'm listening again and again and I'm hearing people talk all the way from Guatilo all the way down about reconnecting. Are you hearing the same thing? Reconnecting with the past but also taking it into the future. Okay. Um, let me do like uh, Wanori did. I'm, I come from my people's tradition as an oratorist and as a storyteller, and we are an active people. How many of you did oral literature? Are you out there? Okay, an active audience speaks back, right? If you don't speak back, I have the right to take the mic, nominate any one of you, and you speak for the rest of my 18 minutes. Do we agree? Okay, so are you hearing me? So I'm hearing a lot of this past to the present. And I'm thinking, how do I connect that with what I am passionate about, which is story. And I'm passionate about story, one, because I've always loved story, ever since I was a little girl. But also because I am excited about what we are doing with our ways of telling stories. And today I've heard a lot of amazing stories told in our ways. One of the things that um, inspires me in this is that uh, maybe 10, 15 years ago, I was doing my master's, okay, 15 years ago, somewhere around there. I was doing my master's in Australia, and I was teaching in a school, in a kindergarten school. I taught everybody from the little ones in kindergarten to the big ones in year 12. And I would be more exhausted after two, year, two hours with the little ones than in a long day with the whole of the year 12 kids. And I'll never forget this little boy called Thomas. Somebody asked us earlier, what does the future of the future look like? And Thomas was the one child in the kindergarten class who had to be taken out of my storytelling classes because he could not imagine. And they said to me, it is something new they were seeing because there was so much of showing kids. Um, every time, you know, you give them a toy and you only have to press a button and the car goes off by itself. Anytime they watched a story, it was on video and everything was dramatized. So whenever I was telling a story, he would ask, is that a lie? Are you making it up? And you know, when you're telling a story, it is true as long as you're telling the story. So I'd say, no, it's not a lie. And then he'd say, you're lying. People aren't green. 
And there was a game I used to play with the students where they would be making up stuff. And I'd say something like, okay, I came into the room, and what happened? And then they'd say, a big fairy dropped into the room. And then Thomas would say, but I didn't see it. You guys are lying. <laughs> so they had to take him out. But I've always remembered Thomas. Because if we're not careful, the future of the future of storytelling would be that we would be having a generation of young people who have no imagination. Because they want everything to be given to them. And they will be asking, Wanori, how do you know that's going to happen? Have you seen it happen? And Wanori is left in that thing of saying, imagine, imagine the future with me. So I am passionate about stories. I'm passionate ever since I was a little girl. And I was kind of, I guess, fixed in this because my godmother is a storyteller. She was a kindergarten teacher. My um, great aunt who lived with us was a storyteller. My father used to quote Shakespeare through the house and then you'd get a prize, kind of what um, Sheila was doing to us, if you could remember the right um, quotation. You know, he'd say something like, friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. And the first person who could tell him what play of Shakespeare it came from got a gift. So by the time I was 10, I, I knew quotations from Shakespeare because I had been trying to get all these gifts from my father. And then I discovered the love of storytelling. Then there was school. I had a wonderful teacher, Mrs. Sutton, when I was in Standard 7. And her idea of rewording the class was to read as poetry. And so long before Kenyans were introduced by the British High Commissioner to Macavity, the mystery cat, who's called the hidden paw. You remember him? For he's the master criminal who can defy the law. He's the bafflement of Scotland Yard, the flying squad's despair. For when you reach the scene of crime, Macavity is not there. And every time I think of our politicians, I understand precisely what they were talking about. And then there was Oricha. I don't know if you know how privileged you are to be born, either in the Uhuru generation, which is my generation, or the generation after that. Because we were the first generation born Kenyans. And we had the freedom to make sure that the flag independence, as Amikal Cabral called it, that was given at independence. You know, at independence, 1963, they just gave us legal independence. And then Amikal Cabral said the challenge was to get political, economic and cultural independence. And it, we were the ones who were privileged to have people who actually worked to give us those three. And we're still fighting about the political part and about the economic part. But then I realized we have not been fighting about, as much about the cultural independence. And yet we were the first generation who went to school and had the freedom to question. When they told us, speak and Burton discovered the lake, you know, Victoria, and then we would be able to ask, uh, and what about the people who are living around the lake? Didn't they know they were living there? We were able to ask about the silent stories. Susi and Chuma, you remember them? Yeah? And ask, why is it that Susi and Chuma, remember those, the two slaves who carried Livingstone's body? Yeah, from Ujiji back to, how did they know how to, number one, embalm a body? What was it that gave them the motivation to carry this guy's body? Why don't we know more of their stories? So we could ask those questions. And then we could move not only from asking what was our people's history, forget Hegel and Trevor Rope who said Africa had no history before the coming of the white man, but to figure out how do we know those histories exist, apart from the way that you know, we'd always been told it has to be written down in a book. And so we were the generation to whom Oricha was introduced. And I became passionate about Oricha. I became passionate about the poetry. I became passionate about the stories. I became passionate about the fact that not just in literature, but in history, in philosophy, in religion, we were finding our own way to make, to know who we were. And not just about the past, because sometimes we throw Oricha into the past, but to figure out a way, as we heard in Nguatilo, um, Onori, Bill, all of those people saying to use the past to figure out the present. In fact, to go back to Michele Mugo. This I remember. Mother always said to me, sing child, sing. Make a song and sing. Beat out your own rhythms, the rhythms of your life. But make the song soulful and make life sing. Sing, daughter, sing. 
around you are uncountable tunes. Some sung, others unsung. Sing them to your rhythms. Absorb, observe, bathe yourself. Soak yourself in the streams of life. And then sing. Sing simple songs for all our people to hear and sing with you. Now, to cut a long story short, I went through school like so many of us, wondering what was I going to do with my life. And then I discovered, now, as children of the Uhuru generation, we thought we would be born and get everything, you know? Water by the year 2000, electricity by the year 2000. We'd be living in a Jetson kind of life by the year 2000. And then the year 2000 came and went, and we discovered it wasn't going to happen. And we each had to find our place to take the step forward and do what Cabral had always said. Flag independence is the beginning then you've got to fight for the rest of it. And I decided with a lot of other intellectuals, which is what intellectuals in Kenya had been doing when they said, let's put this orator thing into the system, that I wanted to be one of those who were in that battle for cultural independence. And I'm hearing a lot of that again today. And so I went on, did many things. For me, the changing part was when in, I guess about 1990, I was part of a group called Theatre Workshop Productions, and we put a play up on stage that the government, as it did in those days, decided to close down because they thought it was going to be seditious. And as we were in conversations, trying to get last minute um, permission to do it, because in those days they could actually do that, the guy said to us, why don't you just go and do a simple thing like Allah Kimboya is doing? Just put an African folktale. Nobody cares about them. And as people started to talk about it in their anger at being censored at the last minute, you know, when you're at university, you can do all these things and no one cares. When you get out there, it's really a slap to the face to discover you're a Kenyan like everybody else. And they will treat you like everybody else. You're not special. And it was the first time our group had been stopped from doing a play. We decided we would do precisely what he said. And we would take the same message we had in the play that was banned, which was, Dario Falls can't pay, won't pay but we would do it by telling our stories. And that was when I woke up to the power of storytelling. Because storytelling is ours. When you speak to us, when you speak Kenyan to Kenyan and you tell a story, or when you sing a song, you know that's why the politicians have us beat on this. They go, they sing a song, everybody's singing and dancing with them, and before you know it, their votes have gone their way. While you're trying to explain a manifesto, you know? <laughs> And we learned that by putting simple stories, songs on stage, we could get our message out. At least we did until they discovered like two weeks into the run and came and stopped it again. But we got it that far. And so I went to school and I just want to finish by um, giving you the th four things that drive me. I'm a performance scholar. My doctorate was in performance studies, which I argue in my dissertation is exactly what the Western Academy calls orature in the African Academy. So when I went off to school, they told me this is this new exciting field we want to bring to Africa. And I spent the first two years asking, but why is this so different? I learned this in Form 3, that you can sing, you can use poetry as a way of knowing, you can use song as a way of knowing, you can use dance as a way of knowing. So da, we've been doing this as long as you have, even longer. In fact, as Zora Neale Hurston has argued, Africans have always theorized, but in hieroglyphics, which is why most people have not got it. And most of the people you've seen today are using hieroglyphics, but it's very deep intellectual work they're doing. And for that, I want to bow down to all of you who've presented to us today. So my work as a performance scholar, we sign up to three things. One, you're an artist, so artistry. And as an artist, I'm doing a lot of work now in taking the work and the words of other Kenyans, actually other people, mostly people of African descent, both continental and diaspora, and putting them on stage so that those of you, for example, I use Michelle Mugo, who don't know their work, can start to, to hear it, to encounter it, and go out and look for them. And I'm, you know, I also do very contemporary people, Ivono War, um, Guatilo, as well as the older artists, Okot Piptek, um, Michere, whom I started with, and so on. My second commitment is to be an analyst. 
And an analyst is to say, artists are not here just to entertain you. They're here to make you think. But we make you think in hieroglyphics because we pay you the ultimate compliment of assuming you're more intelligent than you actually think. We know you'll get it. So we're not going to read you propaganda or whatever. We're going to encode it in a way that you can remember. And my job as an analyst is to figure out what are the epistemologies we are using. How many of them come from the past and how do we bring them? Well, Nori really beautifully demonstrated that when she said, I can start with the myths of my people and then I can bring them into the future. I can be a seer as Mugawa Kibiru was. Um, I know Ngwatilo is doing some amazing work trying to think about how the poetry coming from the, this Kenyan life can become um, encoded in Swahili and Somali poetic traditions. And as Bill said, they're going back and finding the Isa Jumas for us and then enabling us to understand what is happening there. Third, um, my work is to be an activist. And part of it is, yes, to do the political work and the economic work. And artists have not, cultural workers in general, have not been given a tenth, even a hundredth of the credit they should have been given for the work they have done in bringing this country to the liberation that we are in, the sense of independence. But I think it is time that we began to be, fight for the rights and the responsibilities for cultural workers. So that's my third commitment. But my fourth commitment, which was accidental, like I said earlier, I chair the governing council of the Kenya Cultural Center, and somebody has to get into the trenches, and somebody has to learn how to work out the bureaucracy, figure out the laws, find a way of making funding happen, and too few of us who are cultural workers are ready to do that. So I think we need to raise a generation of cultural leaders who take what we know out and convince the rest of the nation that yes, we need funding, yes, we need the laws, Yes, we need an enabling environment. And I want to leave you with these words by Christine Craig, one of my favorite Jamaican poets. I no longer care. Keeping back my silence has been a lever, a weight pressing down my mind. I want it said and printed down the dry gullies, circled in muddy pools outside my door. I want it sung out high by thin-voiced elders, front-rowing murky churches. I want it known by gray faces queuing under gray skies in countries waking and sleeping in sleet and fog. I want it known by hot faces pressed against dusty windows of country buses, and you must know this now. I, me, I am a free black woman. My grandmothers and mothers knew this and kept their silence and played the game of deference and agreement and pliant will to compost up their strength. It must be known now how such a silent legacy nurtured and infused such a chain, such a strong linked chain to keep us until we could speak. Until we could speak out loud enough to hear ourselves. Loud enough to hear ourselves, and believe our own voices. I hope you believe your own voices today. Thank you.